Good afternoon. This is Troy, Big Water UAV Solutions. Today's December 16th, 2021. Yesterday was a very important day. Regarding remote ID, the oral arguments were heard in the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In the lawsuit, Ray State Quads, LLC, versus the FAA regarding remote ID. Um, oral arguments are available. The link is in the description below. Um, I caught wind of that right away after watching Bardwell last night. He had a little bit of a take on it. And I've got my own take on it today, including potential uh, blowback if this is dismissed for the wrong reasons um, regarding the FAA's jurisdiction over certain airspace, navigable versus all airspace. Could open a plethora of unintended consequences regarding airspace in your particular area. So let's go over, we'll pick up uh, where Mr. Ross, who's the attorney for the FAA and the government, um, is giving his presentation. Uh, each side gets 10 minutes of oral arguments in these um, things, these court cases, however, Generally, that never happens because they get their 10 minutes, but it's filled with questions from the judges. That's, that's how this works for oral arguments. Your written arguments, obviously, are more concise. You're not interrupted when you're doing that. But the responses from the FAA are pretty interesting and um, in, in enlightening, I think. And, and they clarify um, what I've thought all along, that this is not, um, this is coming from the Department of Homeland Security. Anyways, let's pick it up here and dissect it, and I'll chime in um, when it's appropriate. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Case and Ross for the United States. Following Congress's prescription to establish rules allowing for the remote identification of unmanned aircraft systems, the agency issued the rule challenged here to allow for airspace awareness to distinguish. Um, compliant airspace users from those that may pose a security or safety threat. How are you defining airspace in the in the uh, petitioners or the, the plaintiffs brief? They're, they're um, objecting to authority to regulate down to the ground, to regulate uh, within people's private property. They say this is as if, you know, the Coast Guard is regulating the rowing of a boat on someone's private pond. What's the scope of the FAA's Authority to regulate so-called national airspace. Sure, Your Honor. For one, I actually don't understand petitioners. The petition itself is challenging FAA's statutory authority. I believe they concede, as um, a matter of fact, um, FAA's direction under Section 2202 of the FAA Extension Safety and Security Act of 2016 to actually issue these rules uh, or rules of this sort. Um, but in any event, um, FAA exercised that authority. Uh, under 49 U.S.C. 44701A5, uh, which provides the agency authority to regulate um, air commerce or um, uh, the means necessary to ensure safety in air commerce and national security, as well as uh, 49 U.S.C. 40102A3, which provides the agency additional authority uh, to regulate aircraft operations, uh, which could directly affect or may endanger safety in air commerce. Um, so is it the FAA's position that it can regulate down to the ground and over private property? Uh, this case doesn't raise that question, Your Honor, um, and petitioners' arguments to the contrary in their reply brief are, are not worth um, addressing in this case. Um, but instead, it's uh, the regulation at issue here was um, simply pursuant to uh, the regulation of air commerce. And uh, courts that have addressed this question, which we didn't raise in our brief because we didn't understand. Well, when it. would be the case to address that? Sure. So I can point the court to Hill v. NTSB. No, no, no. You said this is not the case to mm -hmm. address Judge Pillard's concerns. Sure. Uh, what, and and the we... petitioner's concerns about regulating drone mm -hmm. use below the tree line on private property. Could someone bring in as applied? Let's say we rule for you in every respect. Correct. 
down the road, could someone bring an as applied challenge on Fourth Amendment's ground to the FAA's tracking someone's use of a drone on their own property, particularly when the drone is on the property below them? Certainly, Your Honor. And there's nothing in the rule that would foreclose that sort of challenge um, in some sort of defensive posture. Uh, courts adjudicate motions to suppress all the time on Fourth Amendment grounds. No, now, we're not talking about a motion to suppress. And let's suppose that there's just no enforcement action at all. So it's not even a defense to an enforcement action. It's just that somebody a year from now buys a drone and they want to just use it on their hundred acres in the country. And that's the only place that they want to use it. And they don't want to have to transmit their, their remote ID data to the government. How can they bring that challenge? I think at that juncture, Judge Wilkins, absent any other government action, they wouldn't have uh, the ability to do so. Uh, it, uh, Congress has channeled FAA's or challenges to FAA rules to be within the 60 days the rules promulgated. So unless the agency takes some sort of enforcement action against that uh, ranch owner, I don't believe they would have any ability to challenge it a year from now. Then what is the government interest in obtaining remote ID data from a drone, drone that's operating entirely on one's property? Because, Your Honor, it's um, easily foreseeable for the drone to be operated outside of that person's property. Uh, it, 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 for a drone to traverse uh, a fence line to an adjacent property owner's space is very foreseeable. Um, an anecdotal example might be illustrative and helpful in this circumstance. Um, in 2015, um, I'm told that a very sophisticated drone. Right there. So because it it could actually leave your property, they feel that they can regulate it. They can make you slap remote ID outside of, uh, because the potential is there to fly outside of your own property. Hmm. Operator was... I'm piloting his drone in Gallery Place, just a few blocks from here, and a quick gust of wind caught the drone and took it to the White House lawn, um, completely out of his control, and he was unable to keep the drone from um, essentially creating a, a national security risk. Um, additionally, it's, the rule itself is forward-looking. Um, I think there are so many... So your argument, just to cut to the chase, is that sure. even if there is no government interest or the government interest in, in obtaining data for a drone operating entirely on one's property is that the person may not continue to use the drone on solely on their property. And so for that reason, um, you can't just kind of turn on or off the location um, um, I guess, technology, it has to be on at all times unless you're in one of these FAA authorized identification areas. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, there's nothing for um, FAA to preclude a drone user from using his um, device absent his property, similar to um, a vehicle license plate, for example. Um, if someone is, uh, there's nothing um, local law enforcement can do to foreclose someone from using their vehicle, which is, perhaps not covered by a license plate outside of their property, but um, the regulations exist uh, requiring license plates uh, to provide for safe identification of those vehicles on the roads. Let's say I don't think that's a good enough reason. Do you have a second? Let's say I, I don't think that the concern that someone on, as Judge Wilkins said, a hundred acre farm, or we could imagine it, 10,000 ranch uh, might, in the middle of that ranch, somehow accidentally fly the drone 5,000 acres the wrong way over a property line. Uh, imagine, I think, that that concern is not a good enough reason to regulate what someone does on his own property. Do you have another reason? Sure. Uh, what, what I was getting to previously, Your Honor, is that the rule itself is forward-looking in the sense that um, FAA and Congress foresee a rapid proliferation of drone use. Uh, I think we've all seen models of Amazon drones, for example, delivering packages to our doorsteps or um, 
drones of other sorts being a greater portion of just our public life. And this, in this way, when drones enter a person's property, the FAA is aware of what the, where the drone is if it poses a safety or security risk. Um, very similar to traffic management that um, and um, or planes in the sky, for example, FAA is able to identify and avoid collision between planes. Uh, similarly for drones, um, even if uh, one particular ranch operator, say in the middle of Oklahoma, um, is using his own drone, that's not to say there might be another drone that for, would foreseeably collide with that drone, but it's, it would be impossible to know that there was other. Uh, what, if, what if it, what if, what if. Up it right there. Remote ID is not going to let you know that there's another drone in the area. What he's talking about there is UTM. This is not UTM. This is not unmanned traffic management. They keep throwing these lines out there that it's a license plate in the sky, that it's unmanned traffic management. It is not unmanned traffic management. This is a device meant to track your drone and the controller. And that's all this is, um, in my opinion. Let's, let's continue. I'm talking about on your property below your tree. Even so, um, say there was still another drone that was coming into that space for one reason or another. Would that other drone be trespassing? That would be a separate question to bring an action against the it other drone user. A little bit extreme to say you can regulate what someone does with their drone on their own private property because what they do on their property might interfere with what a trespasser does. That may be the case, Your Honor, but I will return to my prior point that there's no way for FAA to foreclose any drone user from um, exiting their property with the device. And that's that's really well, they could make the regulatory requirement uh, that anybody who's not below the tree line on their own property needs to have this. And then if you're out uh, and you don't have it, then then you're not in compliance. I mean, there's lots of ways that this could have been written more narrowly. I recognize that isn't the rule we have, and this isn't actually the nature of the of the challenge even that we have before us. But we're just probing the interest sure. of the FAA behind this particular rule, and it does seem difficult in some fact situations to to correlate the interest that you've stated and that we see in the administrative record with some of the application. So I will direct the court to um, pages 44, 15 to 16 and page 44, 37 of the text of the final rule itself, in which the FAA addressed um, possible proliferation of so-called FAA recognized identification areas, which uh, Judge Wilkins um, previously noted. Um, and in that circumstance, specifically considered whether there should be um, except effectively exempt areas, as you um, questioned Judge Walker, in everyone's backyard. But allowing such an exemption would completely undermine the rule's effectiveness. Uh, consider, for example, um, a, a series of backyards that are adjacent. His position right there is quite clear. You do not own the airspace in your backyard. You do not own the airspace below the tree line. But they specifically won't come out and say that. But, but this argument right there says that because you can't apply for a FRIA as a private landowner if you have 100 acres out in the middle of uh, Oklahoma and you want to designate a, that as a FRIA, um, you have to do it somehow under some type of community organization. And that, that, that just doesn't fly, no pun intended. Let's get back to this. To one another, if all of those backyards are exempt from the rule, then it's, there would be effectively blind spots for the FAA. I'm, I'm a mad, and maybe it's too, maybe it's unfair to expect the, the regulation to be tailored this narrow. Um, but I'm, I'm imagining, um, you know, there's a TV show Yellowstone, and they own a ranch that's, you know, it's the it's the size of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, none of the concerns you're talking about would apply there. That might be true, but there's no way for FAA to tailor the regulatory approach here to be so specific in that way. Um, and so, rather than tailor it, I think you'd have to be disagree there. 
This needs to go back to the drawing board. They need to specifically exempt shielded operations. You are below the tallest object on your property or in a, in a city, you're below the tallest building. You are exempt from this rule, quite simple. In class G airspace, we all know in class uh, B, C, and D that you have to get Lance approval. To so therefore they know who you are. They know who applied for that Lance and received the authorization to fly in that area at that particular time. They already know that. And they could say, well, you also need to attach a module or flip on your switch when you're in class B, C, and D uh, to flip on remote ID or some variant thereof for unmanned traffic management. This, this is ridiculous, this argument of not including shielded operations. This needs to be tossed out, in my opinion, and sent back to the drawing board, and that would alleviate a lot of this problem. Again, a rancher out in the middle of nowhere, find his drone below tree top level all day long, is not anybody's business. Nobody's business. Done. Back to this. An argument that they don't have to. And I'm open to that. Come on, play. I think I understand, but it, it's that, uh, and it's not to say that um, someone of the of the sort that you're identifying might still be able to request an exemption from the agency. And if that exemption were denied, you know, there could be subsequent administrative proceedings um, contesting that denial, um, or um, some proceeding in which um, the FAA. Um, cites someone for failure to comply with the rule and they challenge it on precisely that basis. This rule does not foreclose the possibility of someone being granted a sort of safe fly zone, no reporting space in their, on their own property. I, I don't want to overstate the possible exemptions from the rule. Uh, my understanding is that it provides for exemptions in these uh, FAA recognized identification areas, primarily for community based or um, educational institutions. Um, but I'm not sure that I thought the rule said that those things cannot be applied. Oh, no, the, the, those exemptions are still available. Uh, so can someone's private property. That I'm not, that's what I'm saying. I don't want to. There are not very the many of those. It was the commenters were concerned. There were not very many of these. Right. FAA recognize identification areas. So, but is there, you said there might be a, some process for an individual getting an exemption if they had. It's, it, I'm, I, I don't want aware of that. I don't want to overstep, but it, it's certainly feasible, I think, in, uh, or foreseeable that were the FAA to bring an enforcement action for someone's failure to comply with the rule, the response would be, I'm not going to broadcast my identification when I'm on my hundred acre ranch. And that's not. Uh, foreseeably within the context of the rule, and FAA could consider that defense in the normal course. Um, that's obviously far away from the nature of the, the challenge actually presented here, which I, it sounds all agree are with, squarely within the, the agency's statutory authority. Um, I, I see I'm over my time, but I'm very happy to answer I have, any of the I have, I have some more questions. Absolutely. So, so this is a real important exchange coming up. Listen, listen to this. Again, it, it, it reiterates the FAA's position, although they won't say it, that they regulate the airspace down to the state of grass everywhere. And I'll give you my thoughts on that in just a second and the repercussions if they're found that they don't, because then somebody else could step in and regulate it Maybe not necessarily over your property, but then we could get a proliferation, big word there. We could get a peripheralization, peri 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 of, gosh darn, of uh, rules uh, coming from towns and cities and municipalities and counties outlawing airspace uh, operations in airspace because the FAA has defended us in a way to say 
No, you cannot regulate the airspace. The FAA doesn't own the airspace below 400 feet or below the shielded operations. It's a conundrum. It creates a problem um, with, it creates a problem with uh, potentially, again, these other regulations coming from these other municipalities and such. I am not in the bag, really. I'm just, I'm tired. I was up all last night because of uh, thunderstorms and stuff up here. Anyways, back, back to this. With respect to the remote ID data and the operator data, can people within the FAA right now that the rule is effective um, access that data in real time? So in other words, be able to um, see the, the data transmitted by the drone and then access the FAA records to match that with an operator. Can that happen today? I believe so, Your Honor. And the government did not raise a ripeness argument with respect to the petitioner's challenge. But that can happen today even though a new system of records notice has not been promulgated, right? That's correct. The new system of records notice is um, for uh, other law enforcement agencies to be able to have that capability. FAA will, um, can do that now. Uh, that is, um, pair the serial number or session identification number of a particular drone with the personal information attached to that device. That's the way I read the kind of oblique language at pages 11 and 12. And I think it's. Um... Right there. So the FAA can't track you. Um, and, and even though it's going to be said that they're not archiving the information, maybe they're not. Maybe a third party vendor is. Maybe the DHS is. But there is a database. You, you can be rest assured there is a database or there is going to be a tracking your particular drone and therefore your movements. 36 of your brief, because um, it didn't seem like you wanted to say that out loud explicitly. So I'm glad that we now have that clear. So now that we have that clear, isn't that a search within the meaning of the Supreme Court's decision in Cairo? Uh, no, Your Honor, uh, because uh, the Supreme Court made clear in Cairo that there is a salient distinction between um, a attachment or installation of a device versus the actual monitoring of the device. But um, you just told me that the device can be monitored today by the FAA. <laughs> but there is not evidence that the, the monitoring has actually taken place. Indeed, the Supreme Court's decision. We can do it, but there's no evidence that we're doing it because the capability is there, but there's no evidence. That, that's a pretty salient point there. Um, they, they, they admit that they can uh, and do, or that they can uh, archive that data. And then Jones underscores that distinction. That is, um, the Supreme Court made clear in that case. Why, why, why in analyzing the rule that gives the government the authority to do that, do we care whether we have evidence that it's taking place or not? Uh, I think that's because the, the the actual monitoring is maybe what would constitute the search, Your Honor. Um, indeed, but the in rule dissent, authorizes the monitoring to take place. So, for to construe the constitutionality of the rule, don't we have to assume that the that the authority that is granted the government by the rule is being exercised by the government? I think the court would assess the constitutionality of the, of, uh, uh, the enforcement of that uh, rule in the normal course. In Kansas v. Glover, for example, uh, the Supreme Court passed upon 
the evaluation of whether it was a search to bury a license plate database and concluded that it was not. But it did not press upon the threshold question, or the, uh, excuse me, there was a separate threshold question of requiring license plates and establishing the license plate database in the first place. And so those are two separate. You're telling questions. me that the rule that authorizes the FAA in real time to monitor drone use of citizens in their backyards and exclusively on their property. Um, that we shouldn't consider whether that is a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment because we don't have any evidence that that is actually occurring now, even though it's authorized to happen by the rule. Uh, for one, yes, that's correct. Um, second, Your Honor, um, the first, fourth, sixth, seventh, and tenth circuits have all held that pervasive and long-term video surveillance of a home does not constitute a search. Um, indeed, the seventh circuit in Tuggle explained that 18 months of surveillance in which three separate poll cameras were directed at a home uh, did not constitute a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, this is a much less invasive form of um, data collection. And indeed, uh, my understanding, based on my conversations with the agency, is it's not as if um, key word there, data collection. Again, this is not about unmanned traffic men. They're they're admitting it right here. It is about data collection and the archiving of that data and tracking movements, drone operators. I don't see how this cannot be tossed out and sent back to the drawing board. Um, it is a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. There are individuals. If, if the Supreme Court held in Cairo that it was a search once the government monitored the data from the beeper that was installed in the can, then why isn't this a search? Well, in Caro, of course, Your Honor, the, the actual case involved an enforcement action taken against Mr. Caro. Uh, and so. Enforcement doesn't make it a search or not. We don't care. Teachers can who search a backpack at school, they're still, that's still a search within the Fourth Amendment, even if law enforcement isn't involved. A search is a so, search. So if, if you're sufficiently skeptical on this score, uh, we urge the court to recognize that a special needs exception applies here. Such here we go. So even if we're wrong, and this is a violation of the Fourth Amendment, special needs, safety and security, toss that Fourth Amendment out because it's all about safety and security. My argument's exactly against this and race day quads as well. Hmm. 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 A warrant would not be required if you conclude that it is a search. Uh, the amount Tell me why I shouldn't conclude that it's a search under CARO. I'm I, I, sorry, uh, Your Honor. I just uh, I was taking our disagreement on this score, and I, I wanted I understand to understand you have the fallback position of special needs. But tell me why I'm wrong about CARO if 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 that's what I'm inclined to believe that it's a search under CARO. I, I guess I will reiterate the distinction in CARO between the installation and subsequent monitoring and. Well, the question is whether an individual has an expectation of privacy. I would assume, I mean, I would trust that the FAA is looking at the information it's getting because that's the point of having the system in place. You know, if, if there's somebody who reports that there are drones, you know, hovering outside their bedroom window, you would assume the FAA is going to look. Well, what, who's that, who's flying that zone, that uh, drone? And so then the question is, does the person who's flying that drone have an ex a reasonable expectation of privacy in either the location of the drone and or the location of the drone operator? And I took it in your brief that your position was no, that they did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy, notwithstanding, for example, Hero, Carpenter, Jones. And I guess that's the question that I think, I think that Judge Wilkins, although he can that's his own point, uh, is probing. The, Why no reasonable expectation of privacy here? Sure. So there's also the threshold point, Your Honor, that the 5th, 8th, 
10th and 11th circuits have said that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in the location of a plane. Uh, that is true whether you are a passenger or pilot of the plane. And um, at, they're talking about at least, uh, you know, special aviation and commercial aircraft. That's a, you know, something you can see from thousands of feet away, not a drone. Depending on the circumstances, Your Honor, you would be able to see a drone from uh, potentially thousands of feet away, depending on the size of the drone. Uh, but additionally, uh, you know, the Supreme Court held in knots that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to your public movements. And um, so both of those doctrines um, intertwine here such that you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you avail yourself of uh, public activity. And um, so that is why there's no there's no search here. Um, I think to return to Caro is that um, my understanding is that the simple monitoring expectation of privacy on my own property I do or my friend's property or some place that um, I, I I was invited to fly I, I do have an expectation of privacy there and subsequent enforcement action would not present um, a, a search at all and because there's no actual uh, law enforcement action taken then there's no uh, ability to raise a fourth amendment claim so far as I understand um, and is that because you think they wouldn't have standing? I mean, the violation of privacy is a violation of privacy, even if no sanction attaches to it. And if everybody who works at the FAA knows all kinds of things about, uh, I mean, you could station somebody on my front porch, the, the letter carrier could stand on my front porch and look in my, my front door window all day long. And the fact that I'm not being, you know, prosecuted for whatever activity is going on inside doesn't mean I don't have a privacy claim. I don't know. I I'm just actually I, I mean I, I think that you're you're confusing maybe the opportunity <clears throat> to raise an objection with the existence of the search in the first place. And I'm just not sure why it would be limited to an enforcement action if if the FAA is in fact getting information through the remote ID program, you have to answer the question whether there's an expectation of privacy in that information, enforcement or no. Mm -hmm. I suppose we're confusing two separate questions here, Your Honor, which is that whether the rule itself violates the Fourth Amendment versus um, Fourth Amendment standing doctrine, which is, I don't think, I, right. and and I, think I apologize were, if I confuse those. Right. In terms of the the petitioners claim that the rule itself violates because it gives access to law enforcement, there I think the rule itself does not yet. Right. And then in response to Judge Wilkins' questions, you acknowledged, but the FAA, in its sort of enforcement role, it does have access to the information. It can pair the remote ID information with more personally identifying information and that's something that this rule authorizes that's correct and so to the extent that that's what is out there in in privacy terms the question there i guess is does that infringe any reasonable expectation of privacy the fact that all of faa or some, you know some people in faa with some privacy protections do have access to that correct and your response to that is it's still not a search uh because the Availability of that data uh, does not infringe a reasonable expectation of privacy for the number of reasons that I've said. The location of an airplane, uh, your um, public movements, the um, the fact that the Supreme Court said in Kansas v. Glover that running a license plate itself, um, so basically what FAA would be doing with the, the drone data is not a search. Um, and if you disagree on all of those scores, uh, we do have the position that, uh, or suggest the court um, deny the petition on the basis that their, their special needs apply here, such that right now there's no way for um, FAA or its security partners to identify drones in the air. Uh, its security partners. Who are the FAA's security partners? Who are they? Would that be the Department of Homeland Security? Would that be the FBI? multitude of other agencies? Would it be corporate interests? Who are the FAA's third party? 
partners. Who are they? And again, special needs. If you decide that it violates the Fourth Amendment, toss it out anyways because we have special needs. And this particular uh, mechanism is. Um, let, let, let me ask uh, one question, but it's it's with apologies. It's, it's a, a bit of a long wind up. Sure. The, the, oh, my, it's going to end with this question: What do you want me to do? Right. <laughs> uh, now, assume I think that this rule does not violate the Fourth Amendment in ninety nine point nine percent of its applications. Because although Carpenter and Jones carved out some, I think, still narrow exceptions to this general rule, there is, I think, a general rule that what someone does in public is not private. And most of the time, I suspect, when people fly drones, it's in public. Uh, now, even for the sake of this, say that above your own tree line will count as in public. But there are going to be times where someone might not even leave the walls of their house. And they're flying a drone on their own property below the tree. Line. And that drone and that person cannot be seen by anyone unless someone were to trespass on their property. In that instance, I think your rule is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. but what do you want me to write in an opinion if I get to write this? Sure. Uh, for one, I will contest that I don't. I don't want to fight the hypothetical. I know, but I will say uh, just for just for purposes of clarity with respect to the rule scope. Um, in all circumstances, it contemplates that operators will be within the line of sight of a drone, and so it's hard to imagine that you would be within the walls of your house and operating the drone outside. And so, even if you're at, say you're at the window, and, Let's, uh, and, and so even, we'll take them outside. I'll the take house. Your, I still think sure. probably, yes, 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 absolutely. I just wanted to clarify for okay, purposes of the court's understanding. Um, my understanding is that the, um, the the rulemaking would have to be um, done again because the technical specifications associated with um, identifying very specific places in which the, the rule would not apply are things that uh, would require a substantial reworking of the rule itself. That's my understanding. Would it? Or is it not that this is, in effect, a, a challenge to the rule's legitimacy and you're saying that's an application that might be invalid. Sorry, I'm trying to be candid with the court, Your Honor, just to say that um, I'm grateful. There, yeah, there's yeah. in the in the mind in the very small circumstances which you've identified, your, um, Judge Walker, that the FAA the FAA's application of the rule does not contemplate that sort of surgical tailoring, such that they would have to reevaluate how to implement the rule itself. Uh, that is my understanding based on my discussions with agency counsel. Is the data, uh, uh, location data, is it stored? No, Your Honor. And that's where I, was, I have another response to Judge Walker's question with respect to Carpenter and Jones, is that the data here is different in kind and different in degree. Uh, because the drone, the remote ID rule only requires uh, drones broadcast their information while they're operated, there's a very limited universe of information implicated here. So it's, a, it's different in degree because uh, people use their drones much less frequently than, say, their That's cell a slightly different question. If you use yes. it, you know, if I used it two weeks ago, does FAA have the ability to go back through its database and say, oh, on that Wednesday afternoon, two weeks ago, Judge Pillard was operating her drone in at Fort Reno? No, Your Honor, and that's why it's different in kind. Okay. It's because uh, FAA... I net to be... Uh fantasy land in a false statement i believe they could i believe they could if uh you know i, I would imagine that lance authorizations there's a record of that and it's kept uh in case something happens down the road they can pin pin on you maybe i i don't know i i think he he just said that they can track it if they want um and and to me that it's not stored in the database or the potential to be uh, disingenuous. It does not store the data. And indeed, so far as I understand, have no have not contemplated the ability to store that data. They have right. other questions. Thank you. Dr. Have, yes. Um, I'm trying to understand your response to the, um, I guess, 
arbitrary and capricious or, or rulemaking challenge regarding statutory authority. So the rule cites two different statutes um, as I guess providing the authority for, uh, and you referred to this when you opened. Uh, so yes, I believe it's. 40103B1 in, in B2. In those, that statute um, talks about navigable airspace, right? Yes. And um, is there a definition of navigable airspace that you can point us to? Uh, yes, Your Honor. It's uh, 49 USC 40102A subsection 32. Okay, that's what I thought you would point us to. And um, it says airspace above the minimum altitudes of flight prescribed by regulations under this subpart and subpart three of this part, including airspace needed to ensure safety in the takeoff and landing of aircraft. So where, where are the regulations that define minimum altitudes for drones? Then? I believe it's cited in um, petitioner's reply brief. I'm sorry, I don't have that immediately available. Um, I believe it's 49 CFR 119, but I'm not positive. Um, but that that does not, the court need not address that issue here. Um, I, I will return to your, I think with the question on the- I want you to answer my question though. Um, I take your point that you think that we don't need to answer it, but- but and that's assume that I think that I do need to answer it. So, so how do I know what navigable airspace is? Is there is there a regulation that says that navigable airspace goes all the way down to the ground in someone's backyard? Um, it it certainly could foreseeably include that, Your Honor. That's for example how FAA regulates um, language about. Um, a flight attendant saying that you need to wear your seat belts and put up your tray tables during, while you're on the ground in a plane. Um, and similarly here, drones could foreseeably interfere with aircraft operations on the ground. Ridiculous response comparing being in an aircraft uh, and the flight attendant having you put your seat belt on because that falls under FAA, FAA airspace, that's that somehow applies to your backyard. Ridiculous. I thought there was a reg defining navigable airspace as 500 feet up. Am I misremembering? No, you're not misremembering, Your Honor. I just didn't have it available. Um, okay. And but but then I don't want to speak for Judge Wilkins, but his question made me think: if the reg says navigable airspace is 500 feet up, and if Congress has authorized the FAA to regulate in the navigable airspace. Where's the FAA getting the authority to regulate 500 feet down? Hmm. Uh, in two places, Your Honor. First, um, it's authority to regulate air commerce, which is um, 40102A3, um, which is a separate um, substantive question than the navigable airspace. But also because the statutory language for navigable airspace includes, quote, airspace necessary to ensure take security and takeoff and landing of aircraft. But isn't there also a concern of much lower altitudes with drones that if a drone, for example, would run out of power and it would just drop if it's if it's 50 feet up and it drops onto a pedestrian's head or an expensive vehicle, it could cause a lot of harm. Absolutely, Your Honor. So it, and what fuck does that have to do with remote ID? Nothing. So the 500 feet, I don't understand this rule to be constrained by that. That's correct. Other questions? Uh, no, not for me. So where, there we go. That wrapped up the arguments. There were very uh, good and succinct questions from the judges. Um, it shows they're uh, informed. I really liked the questioning. Um, I wasn't particularly 
impressed with some of the responses. So where do I think this goes? Well, I think it's going to be a two to one decision, and this is going to be tossed out on. I would sure hope so. If it's tossed out on the uh, 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 authority to regulate airspace below four five hundred feet, then we have we may have a, another potential problem again with municipalities making all kinds of rules and patch quilt. Rule, uh, rules all of us, and I, it's a good thing for us. But anyways, when the decision is going to be made, I have no idea. Um, I hope, again, that, that it's tossed out and it has to go back to the drawing board. And then we come to some type of compromise. The FAA needs to rethink this and implement shielded operations similar to what's done in Europe and and New Zealand um and and give us that airspace again in class G um you know and then because again this is not about on um, this is not about traffic man this is not going to tell me that there's another drone in the area uh, unless I'm actually tracking it with whatever device is going to be used to track it. Um, this is not letting the birds talk to each other. And I some type of form of ADS -B, ADS C perhaps, um, where the drones can talk to each other and uh, some type of display that way is, is in reasonable accommodation as well as we know DGI and other uh, vendors are going to, potentially build remote ID components into, into the drones and quads. And there's no reason that you can't flip a switch if you're outside of class G airspace or above a certain altitude, um, you, you know, and broadcast if you wish. Again, in class G, if you're in B, C, and D, perhaps maybe you have to if you're above shielded operations. But going to be interesting to see how this turns out i'll 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 definitely stay in the loop and, and keep you informed as i hear anything and again thanks for watching remember fpd is not a crime nor is anything else i do including in my own backyard thanks have a great day take care